Well, the American Chemistry Council represents the American chemical industry. They have had an enormous influence on um, the state of American chemical laws. I describe this in my book, Exposed. Um, their influence goes back decades and decades and decades. Um, the chemical industry is one of the biggest contributors to congressional campaigns of all the industries that contribute. They've actually succeeded in, um, we have this law, the Toxic Substance Control Act, which um, has allowed some 90,000 chemicals to be grandfathered onto the American market um, without any testing at all. And every time a congressperson tries to um, strengthen the, the law, the chemical industry makes sure their influence is felt through massive campaign donations. So pretty much most efforts to reform that system have been stymied as a result of the chemical industry's lobbying force. They have succeeded in setting up a system that is so um, old-fashioned and ancient and creaking and unresponsive to new information that despite all the incredible advances in the environmental health sciences over the past decades, uh, the United States has only succeeded in banning, uh, well, number one, there's only five chemicals that are banned in the whole United States. And not one of them has actually been banned since 1990. So for um, 27, 27, 28 years, while the evidence of toxicity has accumulated mightily, mountains of evidence developing around a whole array of substances, um, that evidence has, um, uh, there's been no mechanism within the EPA to actually act on that evidence. And that's the same evidence that has been acted on by the European Union regulators. The European Union, which has its own chemical industry, by the way, I mean, they have a strong chemical industry, uh, what they uh, they do have very powerful lobbying of the parliament and the EU um, uh, institutions. Uh, what they don't have is a campaign finance system like we have here in the United States. And there is also a different mechanism for regulating chemicals in the EU, and that is called the precautionary principle. And according to the precautionary principle, the government is empowered to act based on the accumulation of evidence about the potential harm of a substance. So as you start seeing mounting evidence of actual harm, the EU makes the calculation that it's going to be better to prevent potential harm rather than waiting for absolute perfect scientific certainty about the dangers of a particular substance. In the United States, the level of certainty is very high. They, they re essentially requires like near certainty. And anybody about dangers and anybody who understands science knows that certainty does not exist. There is no certainty in science. There is always an interplay of different studies, different analyses. And so reaching that bar in the United States has been made impossible by this requirement, which was largely written at the behest of the chemical industries because they know that this is a bar that's impossible to meet, which is why we have not banned a chemical in the face of monumental evidence uh, for, um, for 27 years, uh, and have only succeeded in banning five, uh, whereas the European Union has a whole other approach. Carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive toxins, banned, taken out of circulation. And so this is one of the fundamental distinctions. And the last thing I want to add about the difference between the United States and the European Union, because the industry in America argues that to put restrictions on chemical production will impinge on their financial success and uh, will cost jobs and will, and will create financial pressures on these industries. So in my book, Exposed, I actually examined that assertion. And I said, OK, how is the chemical industry doing in this situation where 
all these chemicals are banned. And in fact, their rates of profits are either stable or rising. They, no, no chemical company has come close to feeling economic contraction, as opposed to what they were doing is innovating. They were coming up with new chemicals to actually adapt to these circumstances, whereas American chemical companies have not innovated because there's no uh, mandate that requires them or that compels them to innovate. So in a sense, American chemical companies are just producing the same chemicals over and over and over again that are both dangerous and grandfathered in, whereas European chemical companies are far more at the forefront of coming up with less toxic alternatives. There's another point about the impact of this um, disharmony between the American and European approach, and that is that in the United States, we've imagined ourselves of being at the forefront of these kind of questions. And it used to be that the United States was the model for environmental regulations. But now, some of the developing countries, rapid developing countries, Brazil, China, Korea, Mexico, are looking for their new set of, of environmental uh, uh, contaminant regulations. They're not looking to the United States anymore. They're looking to the European Union. So instead of sending their new environment minister to Washington, D.C. to figure out what the Americans are up to and trying to meet our standards. They're instead flying right over the head and going straight to Brussels and dealing with the, um, and, and trying to bring their standards up to the European Union standards. So what this means geopolitically is not only is the American stance a threat to our health, um, it's also undermining the American position around the world. Thank you.